Okay, great. Sorry about that. That might happen a little bit here and there. Thanks for sticking with us. So as I was saying, so there's a really fascinating history here in Morocco. Um, when the Moors came through North Africa and went into Spain and the Iberian Peninsula, you came and ended up having a really incredible mix of cultures. So starting with the Berbers and then the languages that came in from that include Arabic, as well as French and Spanish, like moving into the 20th century. And um, it also a really incredible religious blend. So the Arabs brought Islam with them. And they're also Christian and Jewish as well uh, here who have lived together in peace for centuries. And actually, um, Adil is gonna talk a little bit about that. Although, Jade, are you on? I think they might've gotten booted off as well from the internet, but we'll come back and we'll circle back around to that. So one of the things about Morocco that we really love so much is, is the value system and what really makes it special. So it's a very relationship-based culture. This picture is actually from March when we were here on a trip right before COVID happened. So to the right is Adil, who will be talking here in just a couple minutes. And then left, you can see his cousin. So we actually got to visit them. They're um, nomads. We got to visit them when we were in the desert. And you can see this kind of relationship culture. It's considered um, collectivist is what we would call it, a collectivist culture. So they think in terms of we, so more so than me. And hospitality is a really human and positive image, being friendly. You'll see a lot too, and just in terms of like flexibility, moving from languages to languages, ways of doing things, the ability to improvise, and also its relationships with other, with other countries. So, you know, it's the gateway to Europe, and then it's also part of Africa, and then it's also part of Arab culture. So it's an interesting time to be in Morocco right now. So on the left, this is me in early March. And then on the right, this is me now here in Marrakesh. So COVID um, has hit Morocco, not so much in the sickness set of um, getting here, but as far as the impact on the economy, here tourism is the second largest sector. It's 11% of GDP. And right now, 87% of hotels have closed. So those that are really the most affected are the guides and the drivers. We work with family-owned desert camps. So it is definitely really challenging for them. So Jade, I'm going to pass it on to you. it as well. So one of the things that we wanted to talk about before we go on our little journey around Morocco is just, again, the what, um, from a personal perspective, how it's impacted all of the families that we work with. So, for example, uh, Hi, can I suggest everyone to turn off the video? The bandwidth from Morocco is really bad. It will help them to turn off all your video. Hey, thank you so much. I really appreciate that suggestion. Uh, Robert Saro, can you turn off your video, please? There. <clears throat> All right. Yep, I'm still here. So if this happens a few more times, what I'll go ahead and do is I'll record the session separately, then send it to everybody. So if it keeps 
dropping, I'll go ahead and do that. Jade, are you with us now? All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and keep going. So we have a route that we follow here um, for our, our trip, and we're gonna take you on a little bit of a journey. So our Morocco trip starts in Marrakesh, and we go out into the Sahara Desert. As, as soon as Jade and Adil are able to be back on, I'm gonna go ahead and let J um, Adil Hey, we're back. Jade, can you go ahead and talk? Yeah. Okay. Um, where I left off, I'm going to share the screen again, is where we're starting with the route. Um, if a deal and you want to talk about that a little bit. Get this. Okay, here we go. Um, good, so I can see that we're on the itinerary. Um, yeah, so basically we created this route um, to kind of showcase the best of the south of Morocco, what we kind of call the Southern Loop. Um, historically, it's a pretty important piece of history for the country of Morocco and North Africa in general. Um, and I'll just kind of, you know, it's, it's important that we showcase one of the imperial cities as well, which is Marrakesh. Um, but in order to, uh, you know, kind of give the true story of the Sahara and how it relates to the rest of the world, you would need to do this route um, to see every part of it. So I'll let Adil talk a little bit more about that since that's where he comes from and how he's, you know, culturally related. So um, basically the highlight of the trip is uh, what's called the Sahara Desert. So the term Sahara means uh, simply desert in Arabic, and it is actually the largest um, desert uh, in Africa and in, also in uh, the Arab world. So um, this desert has many gates or entries, if you want. Um, the main and most famous uh, or popular entry is right after the Atlas Mountains. So you probably have heard of the range of the high Atlas Mountains which is what separates between the, um, if you want to say, dry Africa from the very green and lush uh, North Africa. So once you cross the High Atlas Mountains, if you're coming from Marrakesh or from North Morocco, then you'll find yourself in a totally different uh, climate uh, and landscape. And then a few hours after that, then the scenery will be changed into more dunes and more uh, just vast um, sandy territories. And that's the gate to the desert. So on our itinerary, we uh, tend to go uh, deeper into the desert, not like um, other uh, people, because we want to, um, our people to experience the uh, depth of the also nomadic culture, which means that Along the way, we do encounter a few nomadic families, and some of them are parts of my family. So we get invited to have tea we, uh, after we track them down and we find out where they are. Um, and uh, apart from the, the tranquility and the silence of the desert, the scenery is, is very, very beautiful. Awesome, so it looks like we're on the experiences slide um, to talk a little bit more about um, some of the things that happen um, during the week, uh, during the trip. And as you've heard a little bit about the route and some of the history behind it, um, we'll talk about the experiences. So the first thing that you see on the list 
is local RIADs. And a lot of people, their first question is, what's a RIAD? Should I stay in a RIAD? Um, uh, yeah, so just to clarify, RIAD is just the Arabic word for house. For house, yeah. yeah. Well, a house, but a house with a courtyard in the middle. So an open courtyard to the sky, that means uh, a riyadh, which in, in Arabic translate to um, a light walk. So when you're taking a light walk in an open space inside your house, um, probably around the fountain, you find yourself in what's called a riyadh. So in, um, in the beginning of the 8th century, when the Arab uh, conquerors came to North Africa, um, they were initially just traveling. They came from desert lands. So their um, home state or their habitat was only houses um, that are basically just tents. So when they came to Marrakesh, which was the first place they settled in, they tended to build these houses from clay or mud. But because Marrakesh gets um, really hot during the summer, and we're talking about 120 degrees, then they designed these houses in a way that during the summertime, it won't be very hot. So in the middle of the house, there's an open courtyard where air basically can circulate, which means that all the walls will be uh, colder uh, in comparison to if the entire house was sealed completely. So that's what a Riyadh is. A lot of people would, their first comment when they go into a Riyadh is they notice how ornate they are because, um, you know, just Moroccan architecture is so beautiful and so delicate and there's all kinds of beautiful archways and interesting doors and amazing tile work and colors and textures. And then the second thing they would notice is that their bedroom doesn't have any windows or if it does, it has like a little tiny window. And the reason for that is because the houses are actually built right on top of each other and right next to each other. Um, so your neighbor's wall is actually, it's, it's your wall and your neighbor's wall. Um, and as Adil mentioned, the reason why is so that you can, so that the houses are able to stay super cool in the hot months, which there's more hot months here than there are cool ones. We can tell you that right now. Um, moving on to seasonal foods, I'll just quickly touch on this. Um, in Morocco, we really eat with the seasons. Uh, the majority of the produce that we eat is grown locally, um, and also a lot of it is organic just because it's grown in local farms where the you know farmers are still using methods that they used many, many years ago. Um, tons and tons of really fresh produce and everything is you know kind of going with the season. So you'll notice that maybe what you eat in the spring isn't the same thing that you eat in the fall and so on. Um, Moving on to the third point, we're going to talk about the souks. Um, souk is the word for market, and most people, when they think of Marrakesh or when they Google Marrakesh and see pictures, they see these really colorful pictures of crazy markets with carpets and silver and pottery and all the all the you know treasures that you can possibly imagine. And um, I'll let Adil talk a little bit about the souk tour that we do um, on the days in Marrakesh and some of the things that you'll get to see. <laughs> so when it comes to the souks, what we um, try to do is really just uh, touch on the places where, you know, you'd find tons of tourists, but not stay there for, for too much, for too much time. Um, the souks are only uh, the Arabic word for um, market. But when you say souk, you literally can find everything you need in a Moroccan souk. So from spices to local food to, um, you know, clothing, textiles, carpets, uh, uh, woodwork, metalwork, handmade stuff, a lot of things you can find in souk. So um, the souk of Marrakesh is the largest souks in all of Morocco, and it exists in what's called the Medina, which is the um, ancient part of Marrakesh. So when you're walking into the souk, the first impression that you will get is overwhelmed with the amount of colors, spices, and sounds, because the souks are usually pretty full. 
um, people walking around to explore stuff and uh, merchants trying to sell you a lot of things. And it's, it's really like, a, uh, like a, an identifying experience uh, to Morocco because when you get lost in the souk, um, you find things that um, make your experience much, much better. I can say that the souks are truly like sensory overload in a good way. Um, there's so many things to see and interesting people. And, you know, the whole thing about Marrakesh is that historically it's been a meeting place for so many different people and travelers and cultures. And so um, in, the, in the Medina and especially like the souk area of the Medina, you just, there, you see so many interesting characters and uh, lots and lots to do. This is always the thing that people are like, oh, we could have spent an entire week just on Marrakesh alone. Um, so that's something exciting to plan for. Um, I'm not sure if Ashley had a chance to touch on the yoga aspect of this trip. So I'll just briefly touch on um, the yoga and art um, meaning behind this trip. So obviously Adil talked a little bit about artisanal items um, that are found in the souks and I talked a little about the ornate architecture of the accommodation. So art is present every day on this trip. Um, you will have an opportunity to visit uh, the, we'll talk more about the co-op later, but um, weavers, um, potter, pottery, places, um, metal crafting places, just all kinds of art everywhere you go. Um, and then in terms of the yoga, what I like to say about this trip is that um, with it be with Morocco being so sensory overload, uh, it's really nice to take a little bit of time out every day to just kind of like rebalance and recenter. And um, every trip, the yoga teacher is just kind of like there as that person to bring you back to your center, help you get some clarity from the day, maybe just take some deep breaths. Yoga is not compulsory. It's not like you're going to be ostracized from the group if you don't participate in every yoga class every day of the trip, but it is an offering. You know, we do spend quite a number of hours in the car on the, on the road trip days. And so it's also just good to get that like little bit of movement. So, um, it's there for you. It's part of the deal. It's not compulsory, but it is just kind of like a great way to start the day and end the day and kind of bring that communal aspect to the group. Um, so that's what's up with the yoga. And then moving on through the trip, I think we are coming into accommodations. Um, wait, so we're going. Yeah, the I'm, I'm and back on. I can talk for just a second if you can yeah. hear me. Sorry guys that I keep having to switch on and off. I get, I'm getting kicked off, but thank you so much, Jade, for doing such a great job taking over for us. I want to step back to the accommodations for just a minute. I know Jade explained Riyadh's a little bit. Here's one of the ones, here's a place that we stay in, in Marrakesh. That's absolutely gorgeous. Jade, do you want to talk a tiny bit about that? Yeah, totally. So um, the picture that you're seeing right now is one of our favorite accommodations in Marrakesh. It's a beautiful, um, like family owned farm and villa outside of the city. Um, and we really, we really only work with um, small, independent, hyper local venues because we want, you know, we, we only want to put our guests in places where we would like to stay as well. So um, nothing commercial, nothing uh, chain, nothing like that. Um, the difference between a, well, first I'll just say that all of our accommodations have electricity. Um, even in the Sahara camp, you have electricity. Um, and, you know, private rooms, bathrooms, normal toilets, Western toilets, normal showers, um, uh, pretty much all the comforts of home. In most accommodations, we do have Wi-Fi. Obviously, in the Sahara Desert, Wi-Fi is not really a thing, but the whole point of going out there is to escape for a couple of days. So we will let you know when you need to do that final check-in with friends and family and in email um, before we go offline um, into the Sahara, and then we'll let you know as soon as that data signal comes back. For those people that do decide to purchase local SIM cards um, and have their, it's very easy and we can help, um, Ashley can help get that information to you in advance. 
Um, and there are some cases where you can get a data signal pretty much everywhere, including in the desert. So um, it, it's, it is possible to stay connected if you want to be. Um, and then in the, uh, as you can see, the, this, this villa is just amazing. It's so nice. Um, most of our meals are set up this way where it's family style. Breakfast is usually, all of the meals are, you know, multiple courses and like all local food, really tasty stuff. Everyone sits together and kind of congregates. Um, and let's see here, we discussed the Riyadh and then we're looking at a villa now. And then for Kasbah, Adil, do you want to explain what a Kasbah is? Yeah. So um, basically a Kasbah is much, much bigger than a, a Riyadh. Both are made from clay or mud. Uh, you would find much more kasbas outside of the Medina or outside of the city. So when we depart from Marrakesh and as we're crossing the High Atlas Mountains, going towards the, the desert, uh, we'll be driving right next to a lot of uh, weds or rivers. Um, this picture is actually taken next to one of them where we're pointing to these kasbas. And some of these, these rivers are called the valleys of a thousand kasba, because along the way of these rivers, the installations of these kasbas was very important for um, what we're going to talk about later, which is the Trans-Saharian caravan. So you can think of a kasba just like um, a fortified, uh, like a fortress or a mud palace. It could take probably uh, more than 35 people, and it has four towers, so they're pretty high up, so more than 35, uh, more than 350 meters high, and they're only made from clay. So all these caravaneers or all these camel caravans coming from, from the Sahara Desert, whenever they get weary and tired, they would rest in these kasbas, and then they would keep moving towards their... Um, markets, which is Marrakech. Eventually, the place where they do their trading would be Marrakech. Um, and then also, so in reference to historical kasbahs that you'll get to tour a couple of those and see, you know, ancient kasbahs that were used for this purpose. And then in the sense, in the context of accommodation, there are many property owners that have bought some of these um, old Kasbah ruins and completely restored them and kind of like repurposed them to make beautiful accommodations, but still kind of maintaining that ancient structure. So it's really interesting to get to actually sleep and walk in some of these places that are so, so, so old and yet still standing. Um, so we'll move into this journey over the Atlas. So after Marrakesh, um, we head out on the road and head over the High Atlas Mountains. Um, and the destination for that day would be the Kasbah 8 Ben Hadou. So I'll let Adil talk a little bit about 8 Ben Hadou. Um, you probably have seen it somewhere before um, in a famous TV show or movie. And um, he'll just talk a little bit about the history of this place and what it's all about. All right. So the, um, the full name of the place would be Sar K-S-E-R, Ait bin Hadou. Sar means um, like a village. Ait bin Hadou is the name of the place. If we break that also in three words, as you see, Ait bin Hadou. So Ait means sons of. Ben, or Ben also um, refers to the sons also, and Hadou is the founder of the entire village. So if you see in the picture, there's a lot of pointy uh, mud formations in there, and that's what we call a kasbah. So inside the Ksar Ait bin Hadou, there's more than four kasbahs. And if there's more than four, then you can call it a Ksar. So a village contains a lot of kasbahs. Now, the foundation of this uh, village goes back to the 11th century and it was up until the uh, 30s that Hollywood and also uh, French and Italian ma movie ma makers discovered this place so instead of um, shooting uh, or putting a lot of budget or an expensive budget to build uh, a mud village 
it's very convenient for them to travel all the way to Morocco because we have a lot of sun. We have the, you know, they can hire a lot of uh, extra uh, as uh, actors. So they come to Morocco and then they shoot these movies. Historically speaking, Eid Ben Haddou was also one of the, the uh, stops for the camel caravans. So when they come from the Sahara Desert, um, they stop at Kasbah and Eid Ben Haddou and then they would do their trading for either two or three days. And on the course of these uh, trading days, a lot of other villagers would come so they can see what the caravan have brought. And I'll also awesome. step in here, yeah, in this part, we talked a little bit about how art is all throughout Morocco. And in Ape and Hadou, we get to watch, and um, Adil, I'll let you explain this, but we get to watch some really incredible, very ancient art that was used in the past centuries. Okay, so, the picture you're uh, you're watching right now, you can see uh, this guy has all his utensils, and he has also um, um, what do you call this? Propane tank. A propane tank. So he is actually burning the paper. That's why we call this the burn it, the the burnt painting or the burning uh, paper. Um, a long time ago, the only mean to um, send secret messages was to actually use the blue, which is called indigo. The blue stuff that you see there is a stone called indigo stone. Um, and also tea and saffron. So they would dip the brush in the tea and the saffron, and then they would start writing or painting on the paper. They use also sugar so that the stuff would stick on the paper. And then they would lightly or softly burn the underneath the paper. And then all these colors would come up to the surface because the tea and the saffron would be, um, if you want, burnt or cooked. Now, a long time ago, they would send these papers and the password would be the fire. So even if the messenger is caught, they would only see a blank paper, but they have to actually burn the paper so they can see the inside of it. Nowadays, this transformed into uh, or uh, changed into uh, an, an art form. And so a lot of local artists would uh, draw, uh, uh, you know, uh, either kasbahs or other paintings on the, on the paper, and then they would have to burn it. And this is one of the things that we uh, try to uh, experience on our trip. So we always go and uh, meet with one of these local artists and see the process of the burning paper um, firsthand. So as we head a little bit more into the Sahara, can I just get a quick yes that everyone can hear me okay? Anybody on the chat? I can hear you. Okay, excellent, thank you. Oh, I got a lot of yeses. Thanks for your patience. So as we travel into the Sahara, so this is another picture from this march. And you can see a deal there on your left. So as we mentioned before, we work with a really strong crew of local, local drivers. And for a lot of them, this is where they're from. Like this is their background. And so it's a really incredible way to like bond with everyone in the crew as you're going along on the trip. And so I'm gonna let um, Adil take over a little bit and talk about what happens when we're actually in this. So the camel ride is one of the highlights of um, the stay in the desert. As you know, the relationship between nomads or humans and camels is a very tight bond we cannot navigate or we couldn't navigate and explore the vast Sahara Desert if it wasn't for the help of a very, very strong and enduring uh, creature. These camels, as you probably have read somewhere, can go um, for miles and miles and for more than two weeks without a single drop of water. So they're actually your only friend. 
in in the in the Sahara Desert. So we try also to provide the experience of riding uh, camels through the sunset for our uh, people, and um, it's it's quite interesting. Um, then we talk about you know the differences between riding camels and horses, and what's the difference between a llama and a camel. The the just the feeling of riding a camel is is very pleasing because it's very slow and uh, you get to actually experience and see the landscape very, pretty much. I can also add just for um, any folks that are having that question in their mind about like is camel riding. I'm going to try talking just a little bit more. So also when we're in the desert, I Can anyone hear me? Okay, cool. So um, this is Jade. I just was I was just going to mention that um, in regards to camel riding, we've had some questions before about camel riding being ethical and you know how we treat our camels. And um, I know I Adele can back me up. The, um, the the camels are like members of the family and uh, <laughs> in some ways even treated better than than humans um, and also like Adil said these are animals that have been you know bred for centuries to this is this is their job and this is what they you know this is their home and um, it's a very leisurely walk uh, we don't go out for many 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 hours um, you really get a chance to kind of like bond with your camel and give it a name and like um, take plenty of photos and they're very docile and sweet creatures. So it really is a special experience, um, kind of like a once in a lifetime thing and uh, something to just be enjoyed. And of course, at any time while you're in the camp, if the camels are around, you're welcome to go and talk to one of the camp staff and like spend more time with them or get to know more information about them. Um, all of, the, all of the guys that run the camp are really passionate about that part of their culture and heritage. And so um, they're definitely like a, an integral part of the group. Um, I can see that we are on to the yoga in the Sahara slide. So um, I'll just kind of talk quickly about what a cool experience. I can speak to this experience because I always do the yoga in the Sahara. Um, but I think Adil would say that his um, opinion on yoga in the Sahara is a little bit different. Well, um, <laughs> every single time we try to do yoga, um, I find myself a little bit stiff or I'm also just, uh, you know, enjoying much just the, the scenery, which is okay because anybody of you guys that doesn't want to do yoga can park right next to me and we can just uh, talk about other things. Yeah, Adil always has a joke that his favorite posture is the one where you get to lay down. And then for the rest of you that want to experience yoga in the Sahara, it's a magical experience. We always do yoga at sunrise and sunset. And so it's just a, it's a really awesome experience and um, plenty of opportunity for that. Um, let's see here. We'll talk a little bit about evenings in the Sahara as well. So as you can see in the yoga picture of the camp, um, with the tents kind of in a circle. So um, evening times are really chill, uh, really, really relaxed. We kind of get everybody in there, get you to your tent, let you see your accommodation, get settled in. And then, um, you know, you have free time to go and run around on the dunes, go for a walk, take some crazy desert photos. But we definitely, um, try to kind of wrangle everyone up at dinner time and do like a big family style dinner in what we call the restaurant tent, which is just like a big tent with tables where we all eat together. Um, but then the coolest part that happens after dinner would be where 
all of the guys who live in and work in the camp, um, including Adil and our drivers and all of the all of the local guys get together and perform some music and kind of make a drum circle around a big campfire under the stars. And it is a really, really cool part of the day and a really nice way to kind of wind things down. Do you want to talk a little bit about it? Yeah, so um, we are very, very passionate about showing that part of our culture, which is um, this type of folklore that we play usually around weddings or uh, social parties. And it, it, it's just uh, playing drums around the fire and singing. And we tell people, you know, um, what, what these songs means. And uh, we get very, very excited and happy whenever um, anybody participate either by clapping, dancing, or uh, playing also any type of instrument they bring with them. So any of you guys um, play any type of instrument, please bring that because all the nomads feel very, very happy when they see that. I just am looking at a question um, about drinking and I just want to go ahead and answer that, that question to everyone because that's like, the, that's like the first question I get, but like hush hush. Um, but the answer is yes, you can drink alcohol in Morocco. Um, you, we will do a, a stop uh, on the first day of the road trip to, to a supermarket that sells beer, wine and spirits. So everyone has an opportunity to grab anything they want. Um, so it's kind of a BYOB situation. Um, just purchase what you wanna drink and then bring it with you and the camp and the accommodations will provide cups and uh, you know stuff like that. But yes, absolutely, it's, it's welcomed and not an issue at all. And I'll be very happy to give you recommendations when it comes to Moroccan beer and wine. Yes. <laughs> Um, let's see here. I can see that we're moving on to, so I'm going to let Adil take over from here, just talking to kind of like the, um, uh, oh, what, I see one more question about drinks. Um, so obviously, as Ashley probably mentioned in the beginning of the um, presentation, that Morocco is a predominantly Muslim country, so a lot of Moroccans don't drink, um, but since tourism is like one of the biggest industries in the country, Moroccans are also extremely hospitable and welcoming to it. And it's not like a shameful or shunned thing by any means, especially for foreigners. But um, one interesting fun fact is that there are actually quite a few vineyards in Morocco that produce their own um, special kinds of Moroccan wine, one of which I've never seen anywhere else in the world. And it's, it's called a gris which is the French word for gray. Um, and it's kind of like a really yummy blend of a rosé and a white wine. So that would be what I would recommend to try. And there are many different vineyards that make their own version of it. And um, it, yeah, it's great. But we can also recommend some local beers and you, know, you can always just go for a gin and tonic. Um, olive oil and argan oil, yes, absolutely. You can buy them and ship them. Um, you can also purchase them and take them home if you're checking luggage or we can get it done in small bottles. Um, there's also like pretty much anything like that. Uh, it's pretty easy to carry goods um, that are, you know, uh, perishable or non-perishable out of the country without any kind of like weird customs or tax things. Um, I'm kind of I tend to know a lot about that because I do a lot of international shipping. So I can privately answer any questions about that as well. Um, and then, so we'll talk quickly about um, relationships in the Sahara and some of the people that we encounter, a um, little bit about the nomadic culture and I'll hand Adil over to talk about that. So uh, the lady you're seeing in the picture is actually my, one of my cousin's wives. Um, in one of our trips, we called my cousin and we found out where he is and we just drove there. We had uh, tea with them. So the relationship between people in the Sahara is a, this is like a very vast topic, but um, we have to first know that in the Sahara desert, there's many, many tribes and many ethnicities. So some of them are Arabs and some of them are Berbers and some of them are a mix between the two. Um, all these people 
are nomad for a reason, because when you are a nomad, you are out there living for a period of time uh, trying to take care of your camels or sheep or uh, goats. And uh, to do that, you have to be on a nomadic journey or have to be on a nomadic lifestyle, which means that if the water and food uh, sources are exhausted in the place where you are, you will have to move from that area to another area where you can find more of these uh, sources. So um, relationships between people in general are very peaceful. Uh, even though you live very, very far away from each other, if we're talking about nomadic families, um, to uh, brighten the day, you will have eventually to go and visit one another, have some tea and uh, have conversations. And that is actually the only way to find out more about what's going on maybe in the village, or maybe in the country, because uh, the only source of information would be um, provided by other people. So you will have to establish these relationships. But um, in general, the relationship between tribes is um, a very, very, um, how do you say, um, gentle relationship. Sometimes there will be conflicts, um, mostly around water or cattle, um, we should not forget that this is a very, very primitive way of life, but um, in general, it, it's, a, it, it's a good relationship. So I can see that Ashley. I'm going to try talking for just a minute here. So one of the things that we do as we're headed back from the desert that's really special is each of our trips with Traverse has a community partner. Yeah, I can see guys that Ashley lost her audio for a second. Um, I will, I'll just jump in since I think everybody can hear me. Um, so every trip with Traverse um, has a community partner that's a local partner. Um, I'm gonna go and try talking again. Oh, she, <laughs> she got kicked off now. <laughs> um, so like I said, each trip has its own community partner and a portion of the ticket price goes towards benefiting that community partner. So the community partner that um, Traverse works with in Morocco is, um, is a Berber weaving co-op, um, which supports the Berber women um, in the Sahara region that are responsible for weaving a huge, huge amount of the beautiful and artisanal rugs that people see all over the world. Um, so it's a really, really amazing visit on our trip. Um, it's absolutely incredible to get to see the work that they do. Not only do you get to meet the women who do the work, um, but you also get to see kind of how it's a very matriarchal setup so actually the um well you know what i'll just let i'll let adil tell you more about this because he's had a relationship long the longest with them um so why don't you tell us about the so the, the boss lady yeah so um this lady is um almost 80 years old and she is one of those people that you can just feel creativity um, um around her when you're when you're when you're there um, she never had any schooling. She never went to school or um, never had any, let's say, math or uh, engineering uh, classes. Yet the amount of uh, beauty and um, magnificence and, and, and the product that she, she produces 
in these carpets is, is crazy. Um, I like that she's very dedicated to uh, give these, you know, uh, this knowledge to the upcoming generation. And we're very, very lucky to have someone like her to teach all the younger uh, generations about weaving carpets, which is uh, a craftsman that is getting lost nowadays with a lot of, you know, distraction on you know, social media and, and people want to not you know, pick up the, the knowledge. So uh, from time to time when we're there, we find more ladies learning from her and um, the place as a whole has a lot of ladies uh, that, you know, weave the, these carpets either at home or at the co-op and they would bring it to the co-op to, to be sold. So 95% uh, of the income or the money after a carpet is purchased would go to the lady and the other 5% would go to the community, which is also a very good cause because they need, you know, to repair the infrastructure and uh, help the schools and, and whatnot. I can also say about the co-op, um, so a lot of people don't know this, but um, the majority of um, rugs that are woven in Morocco are, that, that's all work that's done by women. Um, yet the majority of merchants who sell carpets in souks in the cities are men. And so, and, and most of the time, these merchants are not related to directly to the women who do the recording, or, or do, who do the, <laughs> I just saw recording on the screen, who do the weaving. Um, so it, it really is important um, whether, I mean, obviously everyone who visits the co-op has the option to shop and purchase rugs and ship them back home, but that's not really the like reason that we visit. The reason that we visit is to show how and why and where this is such a huge staple of Moroccan artwork and culture. Um, but but also just to kind of let people know that there is a way to ethically source these pieces so that a large portion of the money goes back into the woman's pocket who made it. When a rug travels from an, a loom all the way to a city and into a market, um, the cost obviously inflates a lot, but the amount of money that the person who made that piece of art diminishes. So it's just a, it's a really nice way to give back um, and, and also take home, a, you know, an incredible piece of, of art for your home and that'll last through several generations. Um, cool. So I see here that we're talking about community now. I don't know if Ash is back on with her um, audio. I'll see if maybe you want to, oh, there we go. We'll talk about community then. Um, so I know that for Traverse's trips, community is a really, really, really big part of the company's kind of mission. And um, in terms of the Morocco trip, uh, we also, Adil and I really try to do our best at keeping everyone together. And one of the cool things about this trip is that anyone can book a spot on it. Um, we've had couples, we've had mother, daughter, we've had sisters, brothers, and then also just individuals wanting to take a cool trip, but also maybe get to know some interesting people. Um, so there really is like space for everyone on the trip. And, what we try to do is implement it so that you have plenty of free time and downtime to like recharge and get yourself, you know, get your bearings, but also have these communal elements every day where whether it's yoga or like family dinner or a group activity um, so that we're constantly bringing people together and then also giving you that option for downtime. Um, so I think Ash is going to talk about the optional add-on to see the city of Fez and Chef Shawin. All right, I'm going to give it a try. Can I give a quick yes if you can hear me okay? No broken, but I can hear you. Hardly, okay. Just a little bit. So if you can't hear me, at least you can maybe see some pictures. So we do an app on.
um, asking a sound call. I'm gonna just take you, yep. Um, I'm gonna answer this question. So, a couple of these things right here. So yeah, I'll send everybody a video if you can't hear me too well, but I'll take you through some pictures so at least you are able to see Fez. It's like such ancient experience in Medina, a walled city. And we visit the tannery, walk through the street. It's really some downtown. Um, I think Ashley got kicked off again. Um, so I am just going to pick up where she left off talking about Fez. I do see a uh, question in the chat box about the link providing more details. Um, yes, Ashley will definitely send out the recording and details on how and when to book and where to book. And um, I would say in terms of group size, I mean, we do this trip a couple times a year and it's anywhere from eight to 15 people. Um, so I have, we haven't had a group size exceed 15 yet. Um, I see Ashley's commenting eight to 12. Um, so yeah, pretty, pretty good size group so that everyone gets a chance to, to know each other. Um, but you don't feel like you're lost in a crowd at any given point. Um, Ash, are you back on? Maybe not. I'll keep talking about Fez. Um, so for the add-on, um, it's basically a journey on the I'm train. I'm back. Hold on. Can um, you guys hear me? Okay. Just a little bit. I was talking about Fez. I'm just going to talk again because I feel like every time I start talking, Ashley gets to come back on with her microphone. Um, so yeah, train journey to Fez. And then, I mean, Fez is just a totally different vibe from Marrakesh altogether. Um, if anyone has ever, um, uh, I think a lot of people associate Fez with uh, this giant, massive labyrinth-like Medina. Um, and two other things that Fez is really Wait. famous for is pottery and leather goods. So if you are in the market for some amazing pottery or handmade leather goods, um, that is the place to be. And then Chef Shawin is famously called the Blue Pearl of Morocco. Um, it's, an it's a tiny town built on the side of a mountain. It's actually another mountain range um, called the Rith Mountains in the north of Morocco. It's not in the Atlas Mountains. Um, and it's really beautiful. It's built along the side of a mountain. Everything in the city, including the, the ground, is painted this beautiful sky blue. And um, it's, it's just iconic. It's definitely something worth seeing. If you have the extra time to dedicate to this add-on, I highly recommend it. Um, just after a week of traveling only around the south of Morocco, you'll start to see why we don't include all of this in one trip because you would need about a month in the country to get to see everything. Um, and even that would be a fast paced trip. Um, but yeah, definitely do not miss the Fez and Chef Shawin add on. Um, I think that uh, ideal, it would be good to maybe talk about some other potential highlights for anyone who would be spending some extra time in Morocco, um, maybe just mentioning places like Essaouira, Casablanca, and Rabat and Tangier. Yeah, so for, um, for anybody that is um, interested in spending more time in Morocco, there is probably a bunch of uh, other um, cities that could you know, please you. So it depends only on your interest. If you would like to 
go and see where um, you know the movie Casablanca have been shot. You can go to Casablanca and find out if it was shot there or not. But the the probably the best recommendation I can give would be to go to Isawira because it's only two hours away from Marrakesh and it's on the coast line. The weather is uh, very different than, than Marrakesh. And on the road to Isawira, you can see a lot of, um, you know, Argan co-ops and you can also see these uh, very famous uh, goats, goats on, the, on the trees. Yes, so, sure the, seen those. so the picture that everyone sees when they look this up, if you just Google goats and trees Morocco, um, it's like it's like a thing that goats love to eat um, the nut inside the argan seed and they'll go to great lengths to be able to get them. So it's a really it's a really cool little road trip from Marrakesh. Like Adil said, it's only about two hours. It's a cute little coastal kind of fishing town with an old Medina. Um, really beautiful. Also, you can see the Hassan II Mosque in Casablanca, and we have the capital of Morocco in Rabat. And then Tangier is like your Mediterranean Moroccan city experience. Um, and, uh, with a Spanish influence. With a Spanish influence. So all of these are uniquely different from the other and also uh, within reasonable reach. Um, Moving on to travel tips in Morocco. So talking about the seasons, um, the ideal seasons here for weather would be spring and fall. Um, winter tends to be just a little, I mean, in most places, you know, we are kind of like a, a very arid climate in most parts of the country. So summers are extremely hot and winters have a tendency to be pretty cold but spring and fall are absolutely beautiful pretty much everywhere in the country. Um, in terms of clothing, I get this question a lot, so I'll talk about like men and women. Um, and men are really easy to like, for, for guys traveling in Morocco, it's like the easiest situation for you. Um, you need like a pair, of, a pair of jeans, a pair of shorts, a couple of t-shirts, and you're set. Um, really casual environment. There's not very many opportunities where you need to be dressed up. Um, men, local men here wear shorts and long pants. They also wear a type of like full body robe. Um, and uh, yeah, so just like loose fitting cotton linen is really good to keep you cool, keep you covered. For women, um, same goes for you. Loose fitting comfortable, breathable fabrics and nothing too revealing. As we said before, this is a Muslim country and even though Morocco is a very um, westernized Muslim country, it's still, uh, it, it is still important that you kind of um, follow suit with modesty and dressing a little bit more on the conservative side. So. Um, think less of spaghetti strap, tank tops, and, um, you know, short shorts, and more along the lines of, like, loose, flowy clothing that keeps you covered and also keeps you comfortable. Um, in terms of street smarts, this is just, like, pretty much general travel rules for anywhere. You know, keep your belongings, your, your valuables close to you, keep them safe and protected. Um, keep a strap on your camera if you're carrying a camera. There are issues as in many, many, many countries all over the world with um, phone snatchers. So maybe not running around snapping pictures with your phone in busy and crowded areas because it could get snatched out of your hand. So just, you know, um, maybe not putting things in your back pockets. Um, uh, you know, there's pickpockets running around. Um, but these are things that can happen anywhere. So just kind of, you know, Keeping, keeping aware of your surroundings, knowing where your, your um, belongings are. Um, I see a question about normal shorts. Are they okay? Um, I, I, would say, I would say, yeah, it's fine um, for, for women and men. I, I, for women, I really recommend just kind of trying to keep everything above the knee covered if you can. And then like, it's always, it's always a good rule of thumb to try to keep like the chest, the cleavage and the shoulders um, covered. So like, yeah, shorts and a t-shirt are fine. Um, moving into talking about cash. So most 
places in every situation only accept cash. And it's really important to have the local currency. I know we're close to Europe, but no one really wants to accept another currency that's not, you know, I know sometimes like if you travel, if you're in the US and you travel to Mexico, you can like tip in dollars. Um, but here it's really important that you have the local currency, which is Moroccan dirhams, and um, that you carry cash. Um, if you're making big purchases like buying a rug or buying a piece of furniture and having it shipped to the to your home, um, of course, most of those places will accept credit cards. Um, but if you're just going out for a quick dinner, there's like a 75% chance that you cannot pay with a card. Um, and another really, really important thing I'm going to mention. When you get to the airport in Morocco and you exchange your money at the change bureau, they will try to sell you a prepaid MasterCard that they tell you you can use anywhere in the country. And you should definitely at all costs refuse that option because it will not be accepted anywhere. And you cannot use it in an ATM. And I have seen so many people lose money this way. So no to the prepaid MasterCard yes to the cash um let's see here in terms of ethical travel i wonder if ashley is able to chat maybe. yeah I'll, yeah I'll, I'll try to talking a little bit hopefully you can hear me so um at traverse we really try and um talk a lot about culture and how to be respectful and to be an ethical traveler. And so one of the things that we talk about quite a bit is not giving money to kids. Um, and part of that is because it actually works against like structures that are trying to help those kids and so like a lot of times they'll be on the streets getting money for for families or parents might think it's helpful actually go up in society and so that's where we if you want to donate we can direct you a lot of organizations that are putting their money in change and so that first piece of kind of the ethical travel and then another piece photo etiquette. So here in Morocco and in a lot of other parts of the world, there's a lot of privacy, especially for women and women in Morocco, not so, um, like not so much as you're not used to it. Like it can be a little offensive. So it's really important with, if you're going, if you want to take a picture of someone first, try and establish a rapport. So maybe you just bought something and you want a picture with them. Oh, I see that I'm back. I got kicked off. Ask if you can take. Okay, great. Yep, I'm back. Um, so it's not that you can't take photos, but it's just having awareness and asking and getting a confirmation, like making sure that it's okay before you go ahead and snap that photo. And then some travel tips for solo female travel as well. So we talked about, Jade talked a little bit about the clothing and for females. Um, just keeping in mind like the gender norms, it is definitely more of a um, role-based society. Men have a specific role, women have a specific role. And so keep that in mind um, as a female, you know, just um, make sure you're dressing appropriately for the right situation. It's not, it, Morocco is a lot more liberal than other Arab countries, like hijab is not mandatory. You know, more or less you can dress in normal Western clothing. Um, but just be according, dress accordingly. And then like in many parts of the world, time and place matters. So, you know, just be aware of where you're going, particularly when you're in the Medina, like don't be out late at night, uh, how, you know, travel, walk around with, with um, a partner for sure. When you're staying somewhere by yourself, make sure you've locked your door and don't let people know where you're, where you're staying. Again, these are good solo female travel tips in general. Another good one from Rocco. So um, being kind, but not too friendly. Again, um, 
with men here, and Jay can talk to this maybe a little bit too, we're used to in Western countries like making eye contact and smiling and just, just to us that's more like being friendly, but it can actually be taken wrong here. So you want to just be aware. Jay, do you wanna comment on that a little more? Yeah, I would just, I would just follow up and say, um, yeah, sometimes, sometimes friendliness here can be misconstrued as interest. And that seems really awful for those of us that um, grew up where like, you know, be kind to strangers and smile at everyone who smiles at you and be polite. Um, it's not considered impolite here to ignore someone who says hello to you if you're not interested in getting to know them. So if you're a solo female traveler walking through the markets, just minding your own business, and you're noticing that a lot of single men are trying to stop you and chat with you, it would not be considered rude or inappropriate for you to not make eye contact and to ignore them. Um, because if you stop and say hello, well, first, if you stop and say hello to everyone who tries to talk to you, you'd be exhausted. But also, if you stop and try to say hello to everyone who tries to talk to you, it could be misconstrued as you being interested in more than just a hello. Um, and, and yeah, it, it's just, uh, it's easier to kind of just keep, keep on moving. Um, yeah. I see that we're on a food slide here. And I'm not sure if we have the chance because I got kicked off for a minute as well um, to talk I'm gonna, about. I'm gonna say a few things about foods. We had to jump over that because my internet was not cooperating, but think about this. So breakfast, you can see on left. Uh-oh, okay. I'll just talk about food. Ashley was talking about the breakfast. So the, Mor I, well, the first thing I can say about Moroccan food is that it's delicious, but also if you're trying to watch your carb count, um, you can kind of just throw all of that out the window when you come to Morocco. It's a, Morocco is a really bread heavy country. And um, I mean, of course, like Ashley will talk more about this on all traverse trips, like we do accommodate specialty diets, gluten free, vegan, vegetarian, etc. But just like, if we're talking about general food, um, bread, some type of bread is served with almost every meal. And it's delicious. And if you can and do eat bread, I recommend that you taste every single piece of it. Um, the Moroccan breakfast is um, usually consisting of some kind of um, savory pancake. Uh, the one in the picture that was up earlier is probably everyone's favorite. Um, it's a really, really, really tasty savory pancake um, called cinnamon made with loads and loads and loads of butter. Um, and those would be served with honey, maybe some fresh goat's cheese, maybe some olives. Um, and then obviously for us Westerners that are used to having eggs for breakfast, there's usually an egg option like an omelet or boiled eggs, coffee, tea, orange juice. I mean, mint tea in Morocco is a staple of every meal. Um, it's super sweet, super minty, super delicious. Um, and then other things that you would find at the breakfast table might be some French pastries like pain au chocolat or croissants. Um, and that just comes from the French influence in the country. Um, another thing that you might find at breakfast that is a real treat is something called emlu, which is a Moroccan almond butter that's also made with argan oil and honey, which is incredible. And then the other thing about the food would be the like national dish, which is called the tagine. And the tagine is called the tagine because that's the name of the dish, but it's also the name of the dish that you cook in. So on to your right, where you see the round dish with um, the silver teapot in front of it, that dish is the tagine base. And so all of the food is prepared in that, and then it has a cone-shaped lid that goes over the top. Um, and most commonly, a Moroccan meal that's not breakfast would be some variation of a tagine consisting of fresh, 
vegetables, slow cooked with some kind of meat like lamb, beef or chicken or fish. And then it would be served with bread. Um, really, really, really tasty. And we get to experience a lot of different types of tagines. I'm not gonna talk too much about that because I don't wanna give it all away. Um, you just kind of have to wait and see for yourself. Um, and then other types of food, obviously I mentioned the French influence. So um, you can have like tea time in the afternoon where you might have some kind of savory pancake with tea or some kind of French pastries. Um, there's also this thing over on the right that you see um, with the uh, sugar and almonds on the top. That looks like a dessert, but that's actually called pastilla. And it's a sweet and savory dish. It's made with like a flaky phyllo crust. And the inside is filled with some type of meat, usually chicken, um, made with cinnamon and other spices. Um, it's truly one of the most interesting things I've ever tasted and so delicious. So I definitely hope that you all get the chance to try that while you're here. That's a food that you don't commonly see in restaurants. Um, because it's a food that you would see more like at some kind of a celebration or a wedding. But we do our best to get you to try everything that we can. Um, Ash, are you back on? You want to keep talking? If anyone has any questions about food, you can also just drop them into the chat box and I'll address them um, as I see them pop up. Or any questions about anything, actually? I'm 